By 1965, the philosophy of nonviolence stalled. Across the nation, demonstrations gave way to wholesale looting and burning. Disturbances also chipped away at Omaha's near north side. Those who were idle and impatient for change took their frustrations to the streets. Most often, outbreaks were sparked by incidents with police. If too many gathered on the corner, they were told you to get off the corner, bust it up. And if people didn't move fast enough, the police were out of the car. And thereby developed the confrontations. We began to open our eyes and uh, see what was happening. You know, we were the younger generation then. And we began to realize what mom and dad had gone through. And when we came along, we're not going to take that. We're not going to accept it. City after city, block by block, young people defied police, driving nonviolence off the map. With this revolt came a need for younger, more militant leadership. And in Omaha, Ernie Chambers stepped in to fill that void. I can remember several incidents with Senator Chambers where he was one way or the other. Either he was able to calm the storm, if you will, or able to stir the lightning, if you will, depending upon the circumstances and whatever the need was. A barber by trade, Chambers brilliantly articulated the ambivalence and anguish of a community turned in on itself. He was white America's worst nightmare. He did not go unnoticed. Chambers exploded onto the national scene when featured in A Time for Burning, a documentary examining race relations in Omaha's religious community. The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. This is the big, I agree with you uh, perfectly. This is the basic problem. Then what do you that want white to talk people to me about? Uh, think they're better What's than I can others. Do? I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings that close schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years, and we're tired of this kind of stuff now. We're not going to suffer patiently anymore. No more turning the other cheek, no more blessing our enemies, no more praying for those who despitefully use us. We're going to show you that we've learned the lessons you've taught us, we've studied your history, and you did not take over this country by singing, We Shall Overcome. God bless you, little brother. Come back and see us again sometime. And don't look back in anger. Thanks for taking so taking it so well. He thought he thought we were gonna do in here like they do to us if, if we went in one of their places, everybody would have jumped out of their chairs and got some ropes together and hung one of us. He was a monster. A young black man, a barber, all of a sudden hitting the headlines and, and becoming a national figure, uh, certainly a statewide figure saying these kind of things was unheard of. He was impudent, if you will, uppity. And, you know, how dare he or any of us speak this way to, like the Native Americans say, the great white father. 